paradigms control the results in your life. They have the power over everything in your life, from your relationships to your income. And when you shift your paradigm, everything in your life improves. Hello, I'm Bob Proctor, and I want to welcome you to Paradigm Shift, where we are going to teach you how to make quantum leaps in the improvement of the results in your life. Do you know, to do this, we have to get in and talk about the mind, because paradigms, it's all about the mind. If you stop the next 10 people walking down the street and ask them what a paradigm is, they're going to look at you and they're not going to know the answer to it. So you may not know the answer to it, but it's a part of the conditioning in our mind. And to help us in this particular show, we're going to be talking about developing the higher faculties of the mind. Now, when it comes to talking about the mind, we've got to get an image to work with. You see, no one's ever seen the mind. And we think in pictures. If I asked you to think of your automobile, you'd get an image of the automobile on the screen of your mind. If I asked you to think of the refrigerator in your kitchen, you'd get an image of the refrigerator on the screen of your mind. However, when I asked you to think of your mind, what image do you get? You see, most people don't have an image. And unfortunately, when there's no image, there's confusion. When there's confusion, we immediately start thinking of something else. And that's precisely why most people stay stuck. You see, our mind controls our results, and it's our results that we want to change. And if we're going to change the results, we're going to have to change what's going on inside. Now, Dr. Thurman Fleet, back around 1934, was interested in the healing arts, and he said, we're just treating the body. If you're going to have any health, you've got to treat the whole person. So he originated this image of the mind. I've been using it now for 38 years. I have shared this image with people all over the world, and I have been focusing on helping people improve their income. I've watched people go on from earning a couple thousand a year to over a million because they understood how to make the necessary changes inside so that they can enjoy the changes outside. Now, do you know, Napoleon Hill was a phenomenal author, and he talked a lot about the mind. He talked a lot about our thinking. He talked a lot about our conscious mind and the way we think. Do you know that there's a thought power flowing into our consciousness and we can think anything we want, anything. Play with it for a moment. Start to let your mind wander. You can think of the beach. You can think of a lake. You can think of fishing. You can think of golfing. You can think of playing with a child. Just like that, you can change your thoughts and your consciousness. But you know something? That doesn't necessarily change your behavior. You see... Your thoughts are in the top half. That's what we refer to as the conscious mind. The subconscious is what's controlling the behavior of your body. It controls every action you're involved in. Now, your actions control your results. In Napoleon Hill's book, he said an educated person is not necessarily a person with an abundance of general or specialized knowledge. He said an educated person is a person who has so developed the faculties of their mind that they can acquire anything they want or its equivalent without violating the rights of others. Do you know, I was doing a, a seminar for 2,000 school teachers a number of years ago. I couldn't find one teacher that could tell us what the faculties of our mind were. Now, if they didn't know what they were, they're sure not going to be able to teach us how to develop them. Do you know that we have mental faculties inside, and that's where all our power lies? And what we want to learn to do is develop those faculties. Now, let's come back to this little drawing. And we take a look at it, and I want you to take a look now at these little antennae that are sticking up from the part where the feelings are resident. Why do we feel the way we feel? We feel the way we feel because of the vibration we're in. See, feelings are a word that we invented to describe our conscious awareness of the vibration we're in. Now, we have sensory factors. We can see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. And do you know that you and I are conditioned to live through those sensory factors? We look at our bank account, and that tells us where we're at financially. We take a look at x-rays or listen to the doctor, and that tells us where we are physically and so far as our health is concerned. But does it really? Why do we do that? Well, we do it because we've been conditioned to do it. As a little child, we we're told to listen to what I'm telling you. Well, you look at this. And then we went to school. And what did they do? They give us a sheet of paper that they called a report card. And on that report card were all the marks that we'd achieved on our last exam. 
And we started to let that report card dictate what kind of person we are. Does it really? Not at all. But that's the idea we're operating with, and that's the idea that's controlling many of our lives. Do you see, what the report card really did was tell you where your mind was at for a few minutes, maybe three, four weeks ago. It has absolutely nothing to do with your potential, and it has absolutely nothing to do with what you're capable of accomplishing in your life. Now, let's take a look at these higher faculties. We have reason, memory, perception, will, intuition, and imagination. And that's really what I want to talk to you about here on Paradigm Shift Today. Because as we start to understand these faculties and how they work, we can literally start to take control over our life. Let's take a look at the reasoning factor. What do we do with the reasoning factor? We choose our thoughts. You see, there is a power that flows to and through us. And as that power is flowing into our consciousness, we can make anything out of it we want. That is really where all creation starts in our life. You can think anything you want. As a matter of fact, that's where your freedom comes in. You know, Viktor Frankl, a Viennese psychiatrist, a Jewish psychiatrist, that spent the war years in a camp, he said that while he was in that camp, regardless of the intellectual or physical abuse he was subjected to, no one could cause him to think something he didn't want to think. Our reasoning factor is the mental tool that we think with. Now, do you know, all the great leaders all down through history have all been in complete and unanimous agreement that we become what we think about. What do you think about? Do you want to know what you're thinking about most of the time? Take a look at the results you're getting. That'll tell you exactly what's going on inside. Do you know, the sad truth is most people don't think. <laughs> I had the very good fortune of working with Earl Nightingale for five years. He was considered the dean of personal motivation. He was an incredible human being. He and Lloyd Conant really had an impact on my life. But Earl used to say if most people said what they were thinking, they would be speechless. Now, you may laugh at that, but think about it for a few minutes. Dr. Ken McFarlane, he said 2% of the people think, 3% think they think, and 95% would actually rather die than think. Henry Ford one time pointed out that thinking is the hardest work there is, which is the probable reason so few people engage in it. Now you say, well, everybody thinks. No, the truth is, hardly anyone thinks. Stand back and watch people's behavior. Just study their behavior. And you know something? You're going to quickly realize they'd never do what they were doing if they were thinking. Or listen to their conversation. They'd never say what they were saying if they were thinking. The truth is, most people don't think. Well, how do they function? Well, they, they've tricked themselves into believing that mental activity is thinking. They're just letting whatever's going on outside of them control what's going on inside. Now, that's rather sad, but it's true. Now, go to the next one, memory. Do you know the average individual wanders around their whole life saying, I've got a terrible memory, I've got a terrible memory. I remember one time I was working with Harry Lorraine. Harry flew in from New York to Toronto. He picked up a Newsweek magazine, published every week. When he got to Toronto, it was a recent magazine that day. When he got to Toronto, he gave it to someone and asked them to cut the spine off it and go and duplicate all the pages. Now, on each page, he had taken the number of a page with black marker and big letters and rewritten the number of the page. There was around 3,000 people at that conference. Everyone was given a page. And you know, you could stand up during his presentation, and you could yell out, page 26, and start reading. And wherever you stopped, he would continue. Harry Lorraine had a phenomenal memory. He stood at the door and met most people coming in, or a good number of them. And when he started, he asked them, he said, if anybody was at the door, if I met you, stand up for a few moments. He not only told everybody what their name was, if it was a difficult name to pronounce, he would spell it. Harry had a phenomenal memory. Now, you know, I remember asking Harry one time, I said, Harry, how long do you remember something? He said, till I want to forget it. You see, the truth is there's no such thing as a bad memory. There's only weak memories. Think of this for a moment. These mental faculties that we've got, they're something like our physical muscles. They're our mental muscles. And if we want to develop our mental faculties, we're going to have to exercise them. I want you to imagine if I left this arm in a sling 
and then lifted weights with this arm every day, what would happen? I think you'd quickly recognize that this arm would be rendered useless in a relatively short period of time, and this one would develop very powerful muscles. I often say it's fairly obvious I haven't done either of these things, but if I had, you know what would happen. But you know, it's exactly the same with our mind. If we don't exercise our mind, it becomes lethargic. It becomes useless. It's been said what we don't use, we lose. Now, take a look at those, just those two mental faculties, reason and memory. We have the ability to think anything we want, and we become what we think about. We've got a phenomenal memory. We can remember anything. You see, memory is developed through association. Not just association, but ridiculous association. I want to recommend you go and buy a good book on memory. Now, if you get a good book on memory, you're going to find that there's many chapters in the book. One is to remember names, another one's numbers, another one's places. If you want to remember names, that's what most people would really like to do, just take the section on names and study that. Study nothing else and work at it. Do you know if you worked at that every day for 90 days, just developing the technique of remembering names, pretty soon you would be considered an extraordinary thing by all your friends. They'd say you'd been talented. They'd say you've been born with a photographic memory. The truth is you haven't. Not any more than I have or anybody else. So as you work at this, everything in your life is going to change. Now let's take a look at the next mental faculty is perception. What are we talking about here? We're talking about our point of view. We're talking about how we look at a situation. You'll often see two people in total opposition. And they both think they're right. The truth is they both are right. Do you know, I have a book that I hold up in a seminar. It's Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I've been carrying this book with me since 1963. And on the one side, it's a black leather cover on the book. On the one side, it says Think and Grow Rich in gold stamping. Gold's almost worn off now, but it is there. On the other side, there's nothing. Now, I will frequently stand in front of a person and hold that book up. They're staring at it. All they can see is what's on the cover of the book. And then I look at the person and I say, I'm going to tell you there's nothing printed on the cover of that book. Am I right or wrong? And they'll immediately say I'm wrong. Now, I said, if I insist that there's nothing on the cover of the book, what have I done? I have drawn your conscious attention to what is printed on the cover of the book. You see, I am causing you to focus on what is in front of you. I'm not causing you to look at it from my point of view. I'm causing you to look at it from your point of view. And they'll insist that I'm wrong. And then I turn the book around. Well, they don't want to let go of the fact that I'm wrong, but I said there's nothing on the book. And there's nothing on the book where I was looking at. What was I doing? I was looking at the opposite side of the same thing. We were both looking at the book. Now, I point out there's two sides to the book. And since that person's facing me or I'm facing them, what I consider the right side of the book, they'll consider the left side. What I consider the left, they consider the right. Think of this. This whole universe operates by law. Dr. Warner Von Braun said that the natural laws of this universe are so precise that we don't have any difficulty building spaceships, we can send people to the moon, and we can time the landing with the precision of a fraction of a second. One of these laws is the law of polarity. The law of polarity decrees that everything has an opposite. It's the flip side to the coin, the right side to the book, the left side, the front, the back. Well, you might consider this the next time you disagree with someone, and you might be saying they're wrong. They're right from their point of view. It might not be taking them where they want to go, but their point of view is still just as every bit as accurate and as right as yours. So do you see, it's not what we're looking at, it's how we're looking at it. You know, until I was 26 years old, I looked at the side of me that wasn't capable of doing anything. I never accomplished anything, nothing. I failed at almost everything I ever did. School, I went into the Navy, I went in an ordinary seaman, come out an able seaman. Then I went to work in factories and bars, and I was sitting in a fire hall when I picked up Napoleon Hill's book. And I started to study it. And that got me to think. I started to use my higher faculties. And I stopped, and I used to think, wonder what I am capable of doing. You see, what I was doing, I was looking at the downside of my life. I wasn't looking at the upside. I was looking at the things I had done wrong. I wasn't looking at my potential. And you know, that book caused me to totally shift my perception of who I was and what I was. I started to understand some of these higher faculties, and my whole life began to change. 
But you know, I went from earning $4,000 a year in one year to 175000 Then it went over a million. I have shared these ideas with people all over the world for the past 38 years. I am firmly convinced I can show anyone how to become a millionaire simply by shifting their paradigm. And if you're going to shift your paradigm, you're going to have to learn how to use these higher faculties. Now take a look at the next mental faculty is the will. The will is a marvelous tool. The will gives us the ability to concentrate. You see, I mentioned earlier that there's a power that flows to and through us. And as it flows through us, we give it direction. Do you know the will to the mind is something like what a magnifying glass is to the sun. I can hold a magnifying glass, and I did when I was a child, and you probably did too. And we could cause the sun to focus we would marshal that energy and bring it to a white-hot bead, possibly on a piece of paper, maybe leaves, sometimes on ourselves. And what did we do? We started to fire with it. We took the heat of the energy, focused it, brought it to a white-hot bead. Well, you know, that's what the mind does with the will. The will gives us the ability to take an idea and hold that idea and zero right in on something. You're going to find that all top salespeople have a highly evolved will. All top leaders have a highly evolved will. You see, it's the will that gives us the ability to focus. Think of this for a moment. Remember we have those sensory factors? We can see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Well, they're forever picking up information from outside. All of nature's creatures respond to outside stimuli. Well, the will picks up information from outside and it scatters our brain, literally. So we've got a zillion pictures. Most people have more ideas on the screen of their mind than you'll find uh, in an encyclopedia in a matter of a minute or two. But the person who has a highly evolved will, they think, they build an image, and they focus on that image. And they're the people that really make things happen. It's the salesperson that focuses on the sale. It's the leader that focuses on the objective. You know, I've got a couple of statues of Napoleon in my home. And I've got him there for a couple of reasons. I don't think he was a particularly nice guy, but he was a very powerful leader. One of his biographers called him organized victory. Another one said he had immense capacity for sustained concentration. You know, one of his biographers quoted him. He said, I see only the objective. The obstacle must give way. Well, Napoleon had a highly evolved will. Now let's move on to the next one, intuition. You know, we talk about a woman's intuition. Women don't have any more intuition than men do. Intuition is a mental faculty. You'll often hear people refer to it as a sixth sense. It's not a sixth sense. We have five senses. We can hear, see, smell, taste, touch. Intuition is a mental faculty. And it's something everyone has. Everyone has a highly evolved intuition. Your intuitive factor is what picks up other people's vibration. When you wander in the home, And somebody says, what's wrong? You say, nothing. The dog even knows something's wrong. You'll see it shooting under the table. You'll pick up people's, you know people that are moody people. What do we mean by that? Well, they're either in a good mood or a bad mood. In other words, there's good energy around them where there's bad energy around them. And some people, you want to take their temperature before you even speak to them because you don't know whether they're going to kiss you or kick you. Your intuitive factor is that mental faculty that picks up the energy around the person. You see, your mental faculties really tell you a lot. Your body is a molecular structure. Your body is a mass of energy and a very high speed of vibration. Do you know, Simeon Curley, in way back in the 30s, perfected a form of photography where you can photograph the energy field around a body. Now, as you change the images in your mind, the density and the color of this energy will change. Well, it's your intuitive factor that picks up that energy. And you see, when you're dealing with the mind, there isn't any such thing as time or space. You could have a good friend that's wandering down to Champs-Élysées in Paris, and you could be on Fifth Avenue in New York, and you'll get a strong vibration that you should phone that person. You're picking up their energy. They're thinking. You see, thought waves are cosmic waves that penetrate all time and space. Well, your intuitive factor is what picks up their thought vibrations. You know, I've got a very highly involved intuitive factor, and it isn't by accident. I've consciously and deliberately worked at developing it because I'm working with audiences all the time. 
you're going to find that most musicians have a highly evolved intuitive factor. They, they may not be aware of it, but they're working with the energy of the audience all the time. Well, when you develop your intuition, you've got one of the most phenomenal faculties that you're ever going to find, and it's going to work for you, and you can do that. Now, let's go to the final one. We're going to the imagination. Someone said it's the greatest nation in the world. Napoleon Hill said, the imagination is the most powerful, most miraculous, inconceivably powerful force that the world's ever known. Think of it, an imagination. Do you know, we can build anything in our imagination. Do you know that's where all creation begins in your life? Van Gogh was a great artist. He was asked one time, he said, how he did such beautiful work? He said, I dream my painting, and then I paint my dream. Well, you know, that's what you do. That's what I do. Everything's created twice, once on a mental plane and once on a physical plane. Do you know that the Internet has always been here? It took someone's imagination to see it. How do you really want to live? Do you know that your imagination will take you there? Do you know what our problem is? We build the picture of how we really want to live, and our paradigm knocks that out of our mind because the paradigm's saying, you can't do this. See, the paradigm's like a group of little monkeys in your head that keep talking to you, and they keep telling you why you can't do something. The paradigm doesn't want to change. The paradigm is a multitude of habits. That's what culture is, group habit. I have traveled into many different countries and many different cultures. Do you know something? When you get past the culture, people are essentially the same. We look different. We speak different languages, we wear different clothes, we, you know, we eat different food. But you want to know something? We're all the same. We are all the same. We have a marvelous mind. There is only one mind. It's not a mind for the black and a mind for the white, mind for the Asians, mind for the Caucasians. That's not the way it is at all. There is one mind. Yet we all tune into the same mind. And these higher faculties, everyone has. And we can develop them. And we can develop them to a phenomenal degree. How well have you developed yours? Have you ever worked at developing them? That's what paradigm shift is all about. You see, we want you to take a serious and a conscious look at your life and ask yourself, how do you really want to live? That's what this series is all about. You're capable of doing anything you want. I want to suggest you start thinking of your income. <laughs> That's an area that most people want to improve. I think it's inherent within us to, to want to enjoy time and money freedom. And you're capable of enjoying time and money freedom. You're capable of doing anything that you really want to do. What do you really want to do? Do you know, most people really don't know. If you stop the average individual on the street and ask them, what's your goal? Where are you going? What do you want to accomplish with your life? Most people don't know. It's rather sad. I'm going to share some statistics with you that are rather shocking. Do you know that 1% of our population earns 96% of all the money that's being earned? Think about that for a moment. That's almost ludicrous. As a matter of fact, if you're not familiar with it, you'll probably think I'm exaggerating, but I'm really not. 1% of our population earns 96% of all the money. How did I go from 4,000 a year to over a million? It was no accident. I decided that I was going to figure out what exactly did happen. And I've never stopped studying. That was 45 years ago. And do you know what I found? Anyone can do it. Do you know most of the information that you're operating with that's been programmed into your paradigm is false? Oh, yeah. You see, I grew up with the idea if you're going to earn a lot of money, you've got to be really smart. Well, I knew that wasn't true because I wasn't very smart and I was earning over a million dollars a year. Think about it for a moment. I grew up with the idea if you're going to really win, you're going to have to go through school. I'd gone to high school for two months, and yet I teach mental health to psychiatrists today. How do these things happen? Well, they happen because the person decides they're going to happen. You see, you and I have the ability to make a decision of what we're going to do with our life. Or we can let the paradigm control us and just sort of march along in lockstep type fashion. That's what most people do. But you know, most people live the same. They live the way the guy next door lives. Who's following the guy next door? Who's following the guy next door? And you know something? Unfortunately, none of them seem to know where they're going. 
Why do they do that? Well, they don't really know. Do you know what it is? It's their paradigm. Go into a welfare area. And do you know something? Almost all welfare recipients are third, fifth, and sixth generation welfare recipients. Do you know, no one ever went through school in our family. When we got to a certain age, we were asked, are you going to go? And I said, no, I'm out of here. And as I started to study this material before I had any children, I just changed one question. I didn't ask them if they were going to go. I asked them where they were going to go. And they've all gone through school. Now, do you know, you have the ability through a decision of changing your life. I'm going to ask you to stop and ask yourself, what are you going to do with your life? Do you know? If you've got it written out in a clear, concise statement, do you know what your purpose is? Do you have a vision? Do you know what your goal is? Now, in this series, we cover all these different points. You're not going to learn how to make a paradigm shift here in 30 minutes. But if you keep studying this information, it will become as clear to you as it is to me. You see, I often say I've got license to brag about all the information I've got because none of it's mine. I have just been absolutely fascinated with why you and I do what we do, why we don't do many of the things we want to do. I decided a long time ago that I was going to be in control of my life. No one else was. And then I took a look at a globe one day, and I thought, you know, this world isn't that big. As a matter of fact, the world's shrinking. And I decided I want my company to span the world. And today I have offices all around the world. I'm doing exactly what I decided to do. And you know something? When I decided, I had absolutely no idea of how I was going to do it. That's part of our paradigm. The paradigm we get hung up on how. Do you remember when you were just a little child? That's really when the conditioning was really moving into high gear. And you come and said, Mommy, Daddy, I want to do so and so. And they say, how are you going to do that? And because you didn't know how, they discouraged you. Where are you going to get the money? And because you didn't know where it was going to come, they discouraged you. I heard a beautiful answer one time when a person was asked where all the money was going to come from. He said, wherever it is right now. You see, you can attract it to you. You can attract it to you in enormous quantities. Now, this is about all we have time for today, but remember, there's no shortcuts in life. There really isn't. However, I have found that you can make quantum leaps through the transference of information and experience. And you know, that's what this channel is all about. That's what these programs are all about. And that's specifically what the paradigm shift is all about. So I'm going to ask you to join me again in the next show. And I'm going to dig into this a little deeper. Wherever you see me, I guarantee I'm talking about one of two things. I'm talking about money or paradigm shifts. This is Bob Proctor, and I want to thank you.